from the one true version, the King James Version. So there's some weird words in here that I may, uh, I may struggle with. And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields, and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did, when himself was an hungered, and they which were with him? How he went into the house of God, and did take and eat the shewbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone? And he said unto them, that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. For you reading the King James. Okay. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for your word, Lord. We do thank you for the abundance of the translations, versions that we have, the access that we have so freely to your word. Lord, help us to not take this for granted, but to use it for the kingdom, to study, to be an approved workman, Lord, that rightly handles the word of truth to be able to have access to the scriptures wherever to, to witness to someone or, or something or whatever, Lord. We just thank you for the abundance of grace upon grace that you give us, the many blessings that we do take for granted, Lord. Let us use them wisely to live a life that brings glory and honor to you. Open up our ears to hear your word today, not just to hear, but to be doers of the word, Father, to take and hide your word in our hearts that we might not sin against you. Lord, we just thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I just simply entitled this Lord of Sabbath Part 2. Okay? And last week, Mark read from, I think, Barry and Study Bible, but I'm not sure. When basically Jesus asked him, that's where I had him stop right there. Have you not read your Bible? That's kind of where he stopped. But I wanted to read this time so you could read something that might have popped out to you when you saw it. But it said it was the second Sabbath or however it said it. How did it say it, Mark? That's in the text. I don't have it in front of me. Is the reason I'm throwing it out there for you. Is it on the board now? Second Sabbath after the first. Does any of your Bibles have that? Probably don't. Probably don't have it. Because we don't know exactly what Luke meant there. And, wait a minute, what's that part about not taking anything out of the Bible and all that? But we have all these different copies that we have now. We're studying you know, some apologetics so that we can give our making our case for Christ is what it's called in Sunday school. But a lot of the texts don't have that, so we don't know. So it's been omit, omitted from a lot of your versions because it doesn't, careful how I say this, matter to the whole of the story. And since we have a lot of versions that don't have this, we don't know why it's there, and it's omitted from some of your versions. Study God's Word. Study so you can be approved, but realize this. Here's my point that I'm getting to right off. You don't have all the answers. You don't need all the answers. And you certainly don't need to get on the topics that could be division points or anything else. You need to preach the good news or the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Look at Peter, what he did at Pentecost. He preached that Jesus Christ came, fulfilled prophecy, that he died according to scriptures, that he was raised again on the third day, and that he's going to prepare a home for you and I, so you seem to believe. And it quickened their heart because they were prepared by the Holy Spirit for that day to come. You can't force the gospel message on anyone. You need to live such a good life, Peter says, that they see your good deeds. And Peter's talking about authority at this point, how you submit to one another that they see and they want to ask you. So they come to you because the Holy Spirit is leading them to you to be the witness. That word also means martyr. And it's the last thing that Jesus told his disciples because they still wanted to have all the answers. We naturally do. Are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And right before Jesus ascended, he said, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. 
Get it through your head. It's not for you to have all the answers. I don't know what Luke meant about the second Sabbath day. At, I don't know. There's plenty of thought processes what that, me that means, but we don't have the answer, and it's not relevant to the whole storyline, and we don't have it in some text, so that's why your Bible doesn't have it. Just food for thought. But, did that wake you up? You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Has the Holy Spirit come upon you? Are you sealed as a child of God? Then here's what matters. You're called to be a witness to the world. Are you doing that? And that matters on how you think about the Sabbath and so forth. I mentioned last week that your thought process was probably that fasting was required a lot. It was only required on the Day of Atonement. We went over commandment four, and I hope you realize I'm not pushing for us to meet on Saturdays or, or anything else. I'm telling you from Scripture period that God established the Sabbath day in creation before the fall of mankind. Jesus says clearly that the Sabbath was made for man a rest period so that you could reflect, so that you could rejoice, so that you could build relationships with God and with one another. Yes, in that rest, you're not supposed to work. It is clearly one day in our calendar system. Oh, the sun, we can't do anything about it, determines our, or in our orbit, de deter determines our year. Our rotation in the moon determines our nights and days. But we can make our own calendar system. But our calendar system is based on seven days, even though I like ten days better with three days off, four days on, three days off, it, it makes sense to me. But our calendar system is seven days because that's what God established. It's still here today, just like His Word is still here today. And He, he worked six days, and then He set the pattern and rested on the seventh day, which is Saturday. He set it apart and made it holy for us to remember. Just like we have the uh, festivals and the other sacred days and so forth. They all point to Jesus Christ, which Jesus in this scripture said that he was the Son of Man, and he said that he was Lord of the Sabbath. So what does the second Sabbath after the first refer to in Luke? I don't know. That's simple. We can move on. We don't have to be divided over it. We don't have to dwell on it. But what I do know is what I want to continue on here and talk about the Sabbath today. And in the last week, not this past week, but the week before, you had a part two um, segment of the devotions as well. In, in part two, you read from Isaiah 58, verse 13. And if you didn't notice, Sherry read from Isaiah 58 this week. She read from Isaiah 58 last week. If you turn your foot from breaking the Sabbath, from doing as you please on my holy day. See, here's the sad thing. Most Christians that do honor a Sabbath, however they honor it, whether it's Saturday or they want to do it some other day or whatever, they do it kind of like the Pharisees did in that day. It's a day for me to rest, for my pleasures, or for my hypocrisy if I don't want to do the work and I want to condemn you for the work that you do on that day because I've made sure that I, there was no way that I would take that many steps. That's why I wrote the law... The, the laws of man that way. I want to make sure that it was okay to untie my donkey over here, but not over there. So I either recognize the Sabbath, and I'm so legalistic, or I recognize the Sabbath as in, this is my day to rest. God said to remember the Sabbath, to set it apart and keep it holy, so you would remember what He has done for you. Jesus worked on the Sabbath. We're going to look at that today. That was where the whole controversy came from. The Pharisees did not want him doing the things he did on Saturday. What did he do? He was kind and loving and healed people on Saturdays. But yet they were caught up so much in their hypocrisy that they didn't want him doing that. They said there's six other days to heal people, to feed people, to take care of other people's needs. We're not supposed to work on that day. They held on to that part of the law and didn't see the rest. If you turn your foot from breaking the Sabbath, from doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, if you honor it by going your, 
if, if you honor it by not going your own way or seeking your own pleasure or speaking idle words about the laws you're keeping, then you will delight yourself in the Lord. So if you keep a Sabbath, is it burdensome or is it a joy? Is it a day that you do rest and reflect and build relationships and rejoice that Jesus Christ has come and died for you? I said last week, too, that a day of worship and the Sabbath are not necessarily the same thing. You have the Lord's Day in Scripture. That's found in Revelation. That's the only place it's found. The Lord's Day refers to Sunday because it's Resurrection Day, but nowhere in the New Testament does it say that they met on Sunday instead of Saturday. It was on the Lord's Day that the vision came to John. That's the only place that the Lord's Day is referred to other than the day of the Lord will come. That's the same words. It will come as a thief in the night. So there's nothing wrong with you worshiping on Sunday. You are supposed to recognize the Sabbath, remember it, and make it holy. As far as um, Paul, when he refers to on the Lord's Day when he come to meet, met with some people, it just says that it was on Sunday. Scripture tells us in Acts that the believers gathered together daily. They broke bread daily. They sold the things that they had because they didn't consider themselves their own so they could feed people daily. It got to be such a ministry that they had to appoint Stephen and others. And what did it cost Stephen? It cost him his life for doing good for the gospel message. What are you doing to build the kingdom do you spend time resting, reflecting, relaxing so that you can understand who God is so you can rejoice and build relationships? Leviticus 23, starting in verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed feasts, the feasts of the Lord, that you are to proclaim as sacred assemblies. Yours may say holy convocation if you're reading King James. It means a holy or sacred assembly. For six days work may be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of complete rest, a day of sacred assembly. You must not do any work wherein you live or wherever you live or therein, depending on your, your translation. It is a Sabbath to the Lord, the day dedicated to the Lord. These are the Lord's, Lord's appointed feasts, the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed time. So the Sabbath, like the other festivals and everything else, are sacred days that make us reflect, and in this case we get rest from our normal work, to point to the coming Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would save His people from His sins, who said, I am going away from you, but don't worry, I'm not going to orphan you or leave you alone. The Holy Spirit's going to come. The power that you have to overcome this world, the comforter, the advocate, the one that will walk side by side. And I've gone to prepare a place for you. And I will come again so that where I am you may be also. All of these festivals and appointed times and the Sabbath and Sabbaths all point to Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. We see the Sabbath in Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments. And it's the longest commandment. I said that before. It's also the longest commandment in Deuteronomy. It has the most explanation to it. And in Exodus, it reminds us that God is creator of all things. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, it reminds us that, Jesus, that God is redeemer of us. Because that's what we're supposed to reflect on. I was created in God's image to glorify Him, to bring honor to Him, to worship Him. But I sinned and rebelled, so He redeemed me so that I could do that. And where I couldn't do it on my own, I now have the Holy Spirit living inside of me. I am a priest. I am a saint. I am the one that brings the gospel message, the good news to Jesus Christ. Because Christ has given me the authority and the power to be His witness in the world. And I don't need to worry about the other things. I need to be that witness. It's a holy day, I'll say it again, so it gets through there. Repetitiveness helps to rest, to reflect, to renew, to build relationships, and to rejoice. Because, because Jesus Christ has died on the cross for my sins, I am forgiven, I'm a child of God, and one day I will spend eternity with Him in heaven instead of being punished eternally in hell. Man, that's good news. Are you doing that? Well, what about when Jesus said the Sabbath 
was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Do you, are you understanding this? That He has given you a day of rest from your normal routine and everything so that you can contemplate on Him giving you the daily bread, Him being the provider? For you contemplating the injustice in the world and doing something about it to feed the poor, or whatever it is? Or is it a day of legalism where you don't work or a day of just pleasure where you do your own things? Before we look at Luke chapter 6, I want to do a word study of Sabbath in the New Testament. It's fun to do word studies, I think. Some of you might not think so, but I like it. And don't worry about these number of times I'm going to give because they're just to get a point across again. The Greek word is sabaton. It means rest. It does mean rest, but you've got to know why it is that you rest again. It's used 68 <clears throat> times in the New Testament. Eight of them are in Matthew 12. Seven of them are in Mark chapter 2. And six of them are in Luke chapter 6. That's 21 times out of 68. That's this story that we're reading now about the, the uh, disciples gathering wheat, harvesting, threshing, processing the food and eating it all on the Sabbath day. Probably taking too many steps, like I said again. And then on the next Sabbath or another Sabbath, Jesus deliberately healing this man with a withered hand. All of those 21 times involved this, that story. Well, besides that, Matthew only uses it two more times. And it's on the Sabbath day, the women went out early to the tomb. Mark uses it three times. Luke uses it three times. John uses it three times about the resurrection. We're up to 32 now, almost half. This one story, and then the day that Jesus was, was uh, the day that they prepared on the Sabbath to go visit him. Okay? In Acts, it's used 10 times. And it's used almost every time, all but once, to mean that the, the disciples or Paul went to the synagogues on the Sabbath day to preach. Why did they go on the Sabbath day to preach? Because that's the day they met. Okay? So they went to, to preach then. But in Acts 20, verse 7, it's just simply used as a day of the week. It says the first, or used as, uh, used as a day, which is Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread. Doesn't mean that Sunday was their Sabbath. It means week, because Sabbath can also mean week. They came together, I'll remind you again, every day. Then we've got 1 Corinthians 16 too. It was used as the first day of the week also when Paul said to set aside your money for this offering to go to the poor. He said do it on the first day of the week. Then we have this one that a lot of people want to use out of context. And I'm going to use the New Living Translation. Colossians 2 verse 16. So do not let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only a shadow of the reality yet to come, and Christ himself is that reality. Paul is not saying here the Sabbath can be any day. Paul's not saying here the Sabbath is every day. Paul's not saying Jesus is your Sabbath. He's not saying the Sabbath is abolished. Sabbath is Saturday. It is the day that God established for your rest. In the United States, we are so blessed, we get Saturday and Sunday. We get two-day weekends. Amazing. Five days we work and two days we rest. So if you come together on Sunday and worship, again, what are you doing on Saturday? Are you feeding the poor? Are you fighting injustice? Are you praying? Are you spending time doing things of the kingdom? That's what Jesus did on Saturday. Okay? But here's what Paul is saying. Don't let there be division. Don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbath. What you do is what you do. Thou shalt not lie. If you lie, isn't that between you and God? I mean, it affects other people, yes. But do you condemn somebody for being a liar? But we want to condemn somebody for these certain things. And I'm not saying you don't condemn for a lie, but you don't dwell on that so much. But boy, we let what day we meet or what ceremony we do or how we do this, we let this really be a point of division. And Paul said, not let, not let that be the case. For these rules, these ceremonies, these Sabbaths, these, these things that we all look forward to told the coming of the Messiah. Jesus said all Scripture points to Him. And they are only shadows of the reality yet to come. 
because Jesus Christ will return. And then Paul makes it abundantly clear. And Christ himself is that reality. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath points to him. He is the one who designed it and created it. He is the one who will give us eternal rest. So we need to rest in Him and have peace. Know that, that God will provide us our daily bread. Know that we don't need to have all the answers to everything. Just know that we need to be His witnesses. That if anyone wants to be His disciple, to train up and follow after Him, he must deny himself, his pleasures, his desires and everything. He taught us how to pray, not my will but thine, Father, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, not mine. I have to take myself off the throne. I have to deny myself, take up suffering and dying, take up my cross and follow after Jesus. Because all of this points to Jesus. But let's do a little bit more of the word study. Back to the Gospels, because we covered everything but the rest of the Gospels. Matthew doesn't use it any more times except in chapter 24, verse 20, when Jesus talks about the end of times or destruction in A.D. 70, depending on how you look at that again, because we could get into controversy there. Mark uses it in Mark chapter 1, verse 21, where Jesus taught in Capernaum, remember, and then cast out the demon on that Sabbath because he went to the synagogues because that's the day they gathered together on Sabbath. And Mark chapter 6 verse 2, Jesus is teaching on the Sabbath when he's rejected in Nazareth and almost killed. Okay? In John chapter 5, it's used four times for the healing of a man on the Sabbath. Sabbath. John chapter 7, it's used for two times about healing of a person. In chapter 9, it's used, for two, it's used two times for the healing of a blind man. Are you starting to see a pattern here of what Jesus did on the Sabbath? In Luke chapter 4 verse 2, when he was teaching in Nazareth, it's used. And then it's used again in Capernaum, where the demon exorcism was. It's used in chapter 6, where we are now, six times. It's used in chapter 13 four times when a woman that is crippled by a demonic force, whether she's possessed or oppressed or whatever it is, he heals her. It's used in chapter 14 three times when Jesus heals a man with dropsy. And it's, then again, it's used in Luke 18 verse 12 just to simply mean a day of the week. What did Jesus do on the Sabbath? Did good. He advanced the kingdom. And the religious pointed their fingers at him and said, you got six other days to do that. Why are you doing it on this day? That we're supposed to rest. We're supposed to hold up to these traditions, these laws, everything else. Oh, they did not understand mercy and grace, did they? <clears throat> so what did the Lord of the Sabbath do? Not just Jesus. The one that's Lord of the Sabbath. He did God's work, and He did it to help others. This whole point of going to the cross for the ultimate sacrifice to give us eternal rest. Yet all He received from the religious was objection and then murderous plots for His life. In Luke chapter 13, I mentioned that before. That's the healing of the demon-inflicted woman, because we don't know, like I said, if she was possessed or oppressed. It doesn't say that, but it says the demon is the one that was crippling her for so many years. We read this in verse 14, but the synagogue leader was in indignant, the hatred that leads you to murder in your heart. He was indignant that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. There's the problem. Not that Jesus healed, but that He did it on the Sabbath. There are six days for work, He told the crowd. So come and be healed on those days and not on the Sabbath. Do you say, uh, understand the ludicrousy of that statement? That you're so much tied up with laws and religion that you don't have any concern for anyone's compassion. Jesus' answer, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it to water? And yet Jesus was offering them living water, the bread of life. The reason that He did the healings that He did was so that they saw that He had the authority over disease and the authority over demons. And the authority, remember we've got to this point in Luke so far, to forgive sins. 
doesn't matter how far you're in in your leprosy of your sin and shame and everything. You're not too far from Jesus and He is willing. He loves you. Then should not this daughter of Abraham whom Satan has kept bound for 18 years be released from her bondage on the Sabbath day? When Jesus said this, all of his adversaries were humiliated and the whole crowd rejoiced at all the glorious things he was doing. I'll put these words in the Bible. On the Sabbath. That's what Jesus was doing. So here we are to Luke chapter 6. We're going to get into it this week. One Sabbath, Jesus was passing through the grain fields and his disciples began to pick the heads of grain, rub them in their hands and eat them. Okay, should we concentrate on what the second... Sabbath of the first Sabbath? Or should we just concentrate on what happened here? Jesus' disciples were following Him. They were doing good. They were going from one town to another. They walked too many steps. They started harvesting, processing the food, eating the food all on Sabbath day. Shame on them. <clears throat> but some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus replied, Have you not read? Have you not read your Bibles? Do you not understand Scripture? You can quote it all the time, but you quote it for all these reasons that support yourself and your way of thinking. <laughs> Have you not read what David did when he and his comp companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, took the consecrated bread, or the shoe bread, or show bread, however you want to say it, and gave it to his companions and ate what is lawful only for the priest to eat. Then Jesus declared, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. One Sabbath. Doesn't matter which Sabbath it is. Doesn't matter if your translation has it explained differently or whatever. Jesus was passing through these grain, files, grain fields and His disciples were with Him, however many there were. And they began to pick the heads of grain, rub them in their hands, and eat them. No, 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 no. Okay, that's fine. Let, let's stay in our religious hypocrisy with that. Some of the Pharisees, thank goodness it wasn't all of them, asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Remember, they had made up so many of the laws. Yes, Moses has a lot of laws, and Steve asked me a little bit about that, about these laws in Leviticus and stuff, and what pertains to us today. Yes, they do pertain. But some of them are... Uh, let's see what word I want to use. For that time period and situation, like trimming your sideburns. Okay? Guys, your sideburns are kind of trimmed. You're not, you're not in condemnation of the law. Okay? But Jesus said that none of the law would pass away. You've got to understand what it means. You've got to, to rightly handle that. The Sabbath was not to, do, not to do work again was the point. The point was to do things for the kingdom to think about that because Jesus did not break the law by doing these things that he did he didn't get a pass because he was the son of God he is the son of man the one that scriptures points to the, the one that come, became flesh and blood and lived among us and lived out the law but if you remember Jesus had said before I desire mercy not sacrifice for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners that's what he said when he quoted Hosea 6 6 at the call of Matthew Matthew records that in his bird in his version as well and he also repeats that later in his gospel but here, here's how Jesus answered them have you not read 1 Samuel 21. You know where that's from, first of all, and what that does say. You should go back there and, and understand what it does say there. What was lawful and not lawful. And understand that also in Scripture does tell us this, that the priests did work on that day. How did they get by with it and not break the law? It's not about the letter of the law. It's about the intent of the law. Thou shalt not murder. I have never done that, Lord. Have you had anger in your heart that you wanted to, to the point where you wanted to kill somebody? Yes, I have, Lord. And you repent from it. Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, took the consecrated bread and gave it to his companions and ate what is lawful only for the priest to eat. Now, he's saying so much here. Who is your king? 
the first king of Israel, King David. Okay, the great king. He broke this law and was not found guilty. The priests broke the law because they did work that day. David passed it out to his disciples. And there's no condemnation here. Now someone is greater from, G, from King David's own lineage. The, the Messiah, the chosen one, is here who is Lord of the Sabbath. There is a new kingdom that he is pro proclaiming. You're supposed to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He has shown you he has authority in the way he talks and what he knows of Scripture and how he uh, elaborates on Scripture. How his understanding is how he lives out Scripture. How he has authority over nature, over demons, over sickness, over everything else. And even the power and authority to forgive sins. Someone is so, here so much greater than King David who went in and ate the consecrated bread. That all of this points to Jesus Christ. In Matthew, I told you, Matthew chapter 12, we read this so we get a little more insight into the story. He entered the house of God and he ate, he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to eat, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet are innocent? They're not condemned by the law. But I tell you that someone greater than the temple is here. Jesus even says here that he's greater not only than King David, but the temple in all of its glory. And remember later it says that destroy this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. Verse 7, If only you had known the meaning of I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Matthew had already wrote this in chapter 9. Now he wrote it again in chapter 12. I think Matthew got it. He left his tax collector booth behind. He left everything behind and didn't worry about anything except following Jesus. If only you'd known the meaning of I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. Those that came to Jesus for healing... In this case, those were being fed by Jesus, not thinking they were doing anything wrong whatsoever. How many times do we point fingers at other people and leave them feeling guilt in their heart because they did do something? You do this on Sunday? Or you do this on Saturday? Well, I don't. And you point down fingers at them and do exactly what Paul told you not to do, whether you meant to or not. I don't do that on that day. I don't do this. You know... There's plenty of things I've done in my life before that I did not consider to be a sin. But with the day that I realized that God told me that they were a sin and I continued on, then they were sinful to me, were they not? Mark adds, Jesus declared the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. It's not about rule keeping. It's not about sacrifice. It's about desiring to show mercy because you've received mercy. That pitiful state that you were in, nothing you could do about it yourself, and someone else said, I'll help you. And God desires that from you as well. Enough that you would bring, get three other guys together and carry this guy and raise the roof off the house to put this guy down in front of Jesus. I'm going to read the commandment to you again. From Exodus, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, on which you must not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservants or maidservants or livestock, nor the foreigner within the gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. But on the seventh day he rested. If God did all these things and set a pattern for you and it's for you, Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. How are you doing that? How are you resting? How are you reflecting? How are you renewing your relationship with God and with others? How are you rejoicing for the kingdom of God is at hand? It is a time to celebrate, a time of new wine. I'm building what's happening in Luke in here. A time to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand so that you can do kingdom work, so you can be one that lives for God and His kingdom. In all three of the gospel accounts, John doesn't record this, Jesus then declared, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. That is found in all three accounts. What a Son of Man means. Son of Man points to Jesus Christ. 
you can go back and you can study Daniel and all you want to, but anyone who knew their Bibles at this point whatsoever, knew prophecy at this point, knew that the Son of Man pointed to the Messiah. And Jesus said he's the Son of Man and also that he is Lord of the Sabbath. Wow! Let me step back a second. He is the Messiah, the Chosen One, and He is Lord of the Sabbath, something that God created and set a pattern for. Jesus is saying, I am God. I was there in the beginning. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And if I'm going to heal on Saturday, I'm doing what the law tells me to do. You don't understand the point of the law. No wonder they got indignant. <laughs> the only way to find true rest for each and every day that you live and for all eternity is to know that the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is Lord of the Sabbath. Just a little more word study. Christ is the most common referral to Jesus. A lot of people in this day and age, and there's a topic right there you can go out and start witnessing to, think His name is Jesus Christ. Last name. They don't understand that. They don't understand that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. You can put Christ Jesus. You can put just Christ, and we know it's Jesus. You can say just Jesus, and we know that He is the Christ. It's the most common referral to Jesus. The second most used title is Lord. Just like back in the Old Testament, and you don't even utter that word, don't even put it down in writing. Jesus is claiming that. The third most common title is the Son of Man. And that's the title that Jesus most commonly uses for Himself. To know that you know that He is the one that became flesh and blood and dwelled among you, Emmanuel, God with us. The one who not only teaches the law, wrote the law. The one who did the Sabbath because the Sabbath points to Him for eternal rest and today's rest, and He is Lord of the Sabbath. Is He Lord of your life? Do you believe? Or is it just religious whatever? Most Christians today don't understand the meaning of the Sabbath. Don't honor the Sabbath. Use it as a time for their own. And in worst cases, again, are right back to it being a dividing point. You don't meet on Saturday? You don't meet on Sunday? What's wrong with you? Which was clear that we're not supposed to do that and then we don't really understand the meaning if we're doing that. Jesus patterned it as a day to do good. That's how He kept it holy. I've already said you've got five days to work instead of six. That's a blessing. So you've got two days, one that you gather on, one that maybe you should consider a little bit more about how you rest, remember, reflect, build relationships, and of course rejoice. You might rest on that day. A lot of people do. But do you reflect? Do you renew your relationship with God and with others? Do you rejoice? Continuing on in Luke chapter 6, On another Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching, and a man there whose right hand was withered, looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Well, now you've got Luke writing in here. Remember, he's intentionally he's a doctor that the scribes and the Pharisees came together. Hey, the enemy of my enemy, or the friend, or whatever, let's all get together and let's go after Jesus. Matthew's account says in chapter 12, they asked him if it's lawful uh, to heal on the Saturday. He replied, if one of you has a sheep and it falls in a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take a hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Luke chapter 6, verse 8. But Jesus knew their thoughts. That's what the problem is, isn't it? And said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and stand among us. So he got up and stood there. Did you think about that? Hey, I was just here this day to hear Jesus. <laughs> I got, came together together to hear who Jesus is, and now he's pointing me out. Will you? Will you? How's that? You, you get it? Will you? I don't think that man wanted to get up that day. I'm sure he wanted to be healed, but he's seen the confrontation if he's following Jesus. He knows he's got to answer to men 
And we fear what men can do to, to us, even though we shouldn't because they don't have authority to throw us into hell, right? Scripture tells us that. But Jesus said, hey, I see you over there. I see your fears. I see you're scared. Get up. And don't just get up. Come up here in front of everybody. Uh-oh. Do you want healing? I can offer you so much more. I have the authority to forgive sins. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? Oh, boy, that's a slap in the face now if I'm listening at all. But if I'm on my religious hypocrisy, I'm probably not hearing that. There's a choice here. Am I doing good or am I doing evil? So if I spend the days, which Scripture is clear again, and I spend my Saturdays just on my enjoyment, then I'm doing evil. I have other idols. I can go right to those other Ten Commandments. I am lying because I'm lying to God about my affection for Him. I am coveting things because I live for Saturdays for me, myself, and I, not for the kingdom. Is it a day to save a life or to destroy it? Well, I didn't think I was ever destroying a life, but I guess if I spent more time doing kingdom things, I surely would be saving rather than destroying. I guess if I'm with Jesus, I'm with Jesus instead of against Jesus. And if I'm with Jesus, I'm gathering instead of scattering. It's about kingdom work. It's about Jesus being Lord of the Sabbath. Releasing yourself from your work and from your pleasures to do God's work for His kingdom. In Mark chapter 3, Jesus looked around at them with anger and sorrow at the hardness of their heart. Jesus was a man. He got to the point he was angry with their indignation, but not so much against him, but against others, their hatred for others, because they didn't know mercy. They knew sacrifice. They knew religious hypocrisy, not the meaning of God's law. And he looked around with them with sorrow because he wanted to bring them the gift of eternal life and to healing if just they would repent. But their hearts became harder and harder and harder. Back to Luke chapter 6, verse 10. And after looking around at all of them, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. Now the man's got to do something also to receive this healing. He did so, and it was restored. He heard Jesus' voice. He got up, obeyed, and found healing. Hopefully the man would find healing for his soul because that's the whole point of the Sabbath and the Lord of the Sabbath. But the scribes and the Pharisees were filled with rage and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. And Matthew adds, kill him was part of that plan. And Mark adds that they plotted with the Herodians. Now they brought politics, political leaders in it. Let's get everybody that we can with any kind of power and authority to fight Jesus' power and authority to forgive sins. And let's crucify Him. Let's kill Him. Let's get rid of Him. But that was God's plan all along, wasn't it? I'm going to remind you again, God instituted the Sabbath before sin came in the world and He rested Himself. Set a pattern for us. He redeemed us from the slavery of our idols and our captivity in Israel so that we could go to a promised land. He reminded us that we're redeemers. And Hebrews tells us that, that promise of rest still stands because Joshua did not lead them into eternal rest. But Jesus will if you follow Him. But for now, there's work to be done. Maybe you'll look at it a little differently. Maybe you'll look at more what this Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, did on the Sabbath. Maybe you'll set it apart as holy and live for the Lord of the Sabbath. Is He your Lord? Because He is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. God, the, uh, the Creator, had authority to establish the Sabbath. Jesus has the authority to be Lord of the Sabbath. He gave you authority and power to be His hands and feet, even on Saturday. Do you understand the meaning of this? God desires mercy and not sacrifice. And do you understand the meaning that Jesus has not come to call the righteous, but to, sin, but to call sinners to redemption? 
Here's the real question. This is what it boils down to us Pharisees of today. How many days are you willing to give God? Jesus gave every day, including the Sabbath. Jesus asked the man that came to him that had everything. He had the knowledge, he had the power, he had the prestige, he had the money. And the man said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, I have kept the commands. And I don't think he kept the commands like the Pharisees. I think he kept the commands with a good intention, with a good heart. But he said, there's one day I won't give you, one thing I won't give you, whatever that is. He said that in his heart. He never said it out loud. But Jesus, knowing his heart, said you lack one thing. If you want to go be perfect, know your scripture again, if you want to be complete, if you want to be done with all of this, wondering if you are and having other gods and everything else that this implies, go sell all that you have, give it to the poor. He could have just destroyed it or whatever. Give it to the poor because there's the need here. Okay, and there's not the question of how to do it and everything else. Well, there's to be a wise steward, wise steward. This may take years, depending on his amount of wealth. Jesus said, go and do it and get rid of it, and then come and follow me. Give it to the poor in the meantime. Feed them. Clothe them. I don't know what all that means. But I know here's what it points out to me again, and especially in this set of scriptures. What am I holding back from Jesus? And when we're talking about a day of my life, what am I not willing to give up of my time to honor Jesus? A day's a lot. I mean, an hour or two coming to church, that's what most Christians give up nowadays. If we want to be real good Christians, we give up Wednesday night. We might give up a Sunday night or some other time. But a whole day? Am I willing to do that for the one who gave up everything for me? Or am I holding anything back from Jesus? Because he said to you and I, period, get up from that tax collector booth and come and follow me. Get up from all those things in this world that provide you comfort, peace, power, whatever it is that, that fill your fears that you don't have because you don't have to worry about daily bread tomorrow. And I can throw so many more scriptures in here not to worry about those things. But will you just get up and follow Jesus? Even if that means giving up a day that you like having that day for yourself or whatever it is in your life that's keeping you from serving God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and to love others as you love yourself. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for your word. We thank you that God even rested to show us that there is a rest from our works. But for now, there's a time to work for the kingdom. Because there's urgency. Because we don't know if Jesus Christ will return today or tomorrow or when He'll return. We don't know when our life will be required for us. So Father, help us not to concentrate on building bigger barns, but to realize the goodness and the grace and the mercy that we have, the riches that we truly have, so that we can be rich to others. To know the comfort that we've been given so that we can provide comfort for others. To realize that we are priests that offer spiritual sacrifices that are holy and pleasing to God, which is our only reasonable and prudent service. It just makes sense. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ humbled himself became flesh and blood and then humbled himself all the way to the joy of the cross because he was providing atonement for our sins so that we could be forgiven and restored into your kingdom, Father, as your children. Help us to not think lightly of such a great salvation and to know how blessed we are to be called children of God. We thank you and praise you. Ask forgiveness for our sins, Lord, and ask you to increase our faith and our love for our Savior who loved us completely. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.